Now it's time to talk about unit deployment. In order to add units to your army, they must be deployed and placed onto the battle map. Units are primarily deployed from wild terrain, war camps, and settlements. As the game progresses, additional methods of unit deployment can be made available. These include upgrading of squad units or usage of unique unit abilities, for example, the Living Dead's Grave Dig ability. By default, all newly deployed units start with zero loyalty. During gameplay, you will utilize the player guide to look up the various squad and elite units that you wish to deploy within your army. Each unit lists the means by which they can be deployed from. There are two categories of units which differ from in their primary method of deployment. Units that are wild and those that are not. Wild units can be deployed by units, war camps, and settlements, but requires being deployed onto their listed wild terrain on the battle map. Units that are not wild are primarily deployed by war camps or settlements and have no terrain type deployment restrictions. Both war camps and settlements can deploy the same list of non-wild units. However, each wild terrain type has a unique list of native wild units that can be deployed onto its space. Deploying a unit requires the following conditions to be satisfied. The unit to be deployed has a reference card and subname matching ID pieces available within the unit card box and recruitment bin. There are only four copies of each squad unit and two copies of each elite unit. Each copy has a unique subname. This limited number of unit copies is intentional. Once all copies of a unit are actively deployed onto the battle map, no player will be able to deploy another copy of this depleted unit. When a unit leaves the battle map, either through death, recall, or retreat, their reference card and subname matching ID pieces are returned to the recruitment bin and respective card box. Any returned copy of a unit will then be available for all players for potential future deployments. Deployment of a new unit requires paying gold equal to the desired unit's listed deployment cost. If your warlord has a good alignment, you cannot deploy an evil unit. If your warlord has an evil alignment, you cannot deploy a good unit. The battle map ground space that a new unit is to be deployed onto cannot already be occupied by any other unit. Flying units cannot be deployed onto the sky terrain as with all units they must start on the ground. To summarize, to deploy a unit first pay gold based on its listed deployment cost. Then grab the subname matching unit ID pieces and reference card from the recruitment bin. Place the initiative ID piece onto its listed initiative column at the end of the queue disabled. Place the battle map ID piece onto the targeted and unoccupied ground terrain also disabled. The reference card is placed within your player space. If the unit has a listed starting supply, Place X supply tokens face up over that card's portrait. You are this unit's owner and controller. Should ownership of a unit change, move the reference card to the new owning player space. Regarding the army color tokens, after successfully deploying your unit, you can optionally place your army color tokens just below the battle map ID piece. The army color token game pieces help color code your army, making it easier for all players to quickly assess the ownership and positioning of all player units and war camps. When moving your unit along the battle map spaces, be sure to move their army color token piece along with it. Now that I have discussed the rules of deployment, let's see it in action. And we're going to assume that we're playing as player three and one of their units, the Monastery Gargoyles. And in this first scenario, we're going to deploy a wild unit. So it is the Monastery Gargoyles turn. 
for player three, they want to deploy a Wandering Spirits. Now, the Wandering Spirits can be deployed from any of the different wild terrain types. Now, the wild terrains are any terrain that's not plains terrain or the sky terrain above it. Settlements are also not wild terrain. So, for example, these rivers here, the snowland, the mountains, the desert, the forest, or the swamps, they all classify as being wild terrain. And if you would look within each of their respective deploy wild unit deployment lists, each of them would list the wandering spirits as a deployable unit. So the Monastery Gargoyles is first going to move end their movement, and then take an action to deploy a wild unit. Deploying a wild unit is one of the universal abilities that all units, war camps, and settlements have. In this case, we're going to deploy the Wandering Spirits, and I grabbed the reference card that has the Wandering Spirits subname of Vesper. So player three grabs this unit reference card, and Within the player guide, it'll note the deployment cost for the Wandering Spirits, but also on the reference card, it'll also mention what the deployment cost is. In this case, it costs 12 gold to deploy the Wandering Spirits. So I'm going to grab 12 gold and refund the player accordingly. In addition, I must now grab the ID pieces that match the subname of the Wandering Spirits. In this case, I want to grab both pieces, which also say Vesper for a subname for the Wandering Spirits. Now, the piece with the movement icon is going to be placed on the battle map at the location that that unit gets deployed. In this case, the Wandering Spirits need to be deployed onto a nearby, unoccupied wild terrain. So I'm going to place them right over here. And as with all unit deployments, all units are going to start disabled, so the disabled side is being shown. The other ID piece, the one with the blue eyeball, eyeball, is the initiative ID piece, and that gets placed on the initiative table at their respective number. In this case, the Wandering Spirits have an initiative of one, so they get placed onto the ones column of the initiative table. The last thing to check is, does the Wandering Spirits have any starting supply? In this case, they do not. So deployment is finished for deploying this wild unit. Now I'm going to go over deployment from a war camp or settlement. In this case, I'm going to do deployment from a settlement. They're both handled exactly the same way uh, regarding rules and deployment options. And we're going to be working with player two's assets uh, in order to handle this. So let's just assume that player two is protecting settlement three. And it is now settlement three's turn. During Settlement 3's turn, first we check on the Settlement tile, it'll list what they can do. So first we check for defending the Settlement, there's nothing to defend. Then we check for provisioning of the Settlement, everything's at full health and supply, so nothing to provision. And the last bit is, do we want to deploy from this Settlement? In this case, we do. Player 2 wants to deploy an elite unit known as the Fasted Monk. And for this Facet Monk, their subname is called Pale Tongue. And their deployment cost is going to be 36 gold. And once again, a player is encouraged to look into the player guide for choosing which units they would like to deploy within their army. So now that player 2 has paid the 36 gold to deploy the Facet Monk, there's a check for any supply. The Faster Monk does not start with any supply, so the last thing that the player needs to do is just make sure that they grab the unit ID pieces from the recruitment bin. And once again, these unit ID pieces need to match on the subname for the reference card. So in this case, these ID pieces have underlined Pale Tongue as the unit reference card also states Pale Tongue. One piece, the one with the blue eyeball, goes onto the initiative table, disabled. And in this case, the, the Fasted Monk has an initiative of seven. They always start from the bottom and float to the top until they can't get any higher. So they're always being added to the back of the queue on the initiative table. And then the battle map ID piece is going to be placed 
anywhere within the settlement borders, which can also include on top of the settlement. So this is where the Fasted Monk is going to be deployed from. So let's just assume that player three wanted to start their Fasted Monk right here, just one space away, which is within settlement three's borders. And that's how unit deployment is handled. Let's quickly discuss disabled state and disabled units. During gameplay, there are situations where units will start or become disabled. When a unit is disabled, both its initiative and battle map ID pieces are flipped, displaying their bottom side of the ID piece, which has the disabled icon. It should be noted that only squad and elite units can be disabled. Warlords can never be disabled. By default, all units are deployed disabled. Whenever a unit starts a recall, either by performing the universal recall ability or a forced automatic recall due to a loss of loyalty, that unit also proceeds to disable itself. When moving its initiative ID piece into the recall section of the initiative table. As long as a unit's initiative ID piece remains in the unit recall column, it cannot be enabled. Some unique unit abilities can allow a unit to start enabled, become enabled, or become disabled. As an example, the Mythical Siren's Morning Call ability allows deployed units to start enabled. At the end of each round, during Flip and Enable, all disabled units will have their initiative ID piece and battle map ID piece enabled and flipped over to reveal their top side. Now what's the significance of being disabled? A disabled unit has its turn skipped during the handling of all units at the very start of a game round. A disabled unit also skips its upkeep payment without any penalty. A disabled unit cannot lose loyalty but can still gain loyalty. Disabled units can still be targeted and attacked while on the battle map by default, all unique unit abilities of a disabled unit are not active or activatable. However, there are some unique unit abilities that will state an exception to this rule, informing that it remains active while the unit is disabled. Because of this, a disabled unit cannot perform the universal dual interruption ability. Finally, a disabled unit cannot be targeted during the Persuade event as they cannot lose loyalty while they are disabled.